Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching the original solutions to any of the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the middle of redoing the problems and we are on page number 282. Please turn to it. Page number 282 and the problem that we are about to solve is number 85. Let's take a look at it. Number 85. In number 85, they tell us that x and y are integers. They tell us that they are whole numbers. The question simply is, how much is x plus y? How much is x plus y? That's what it is. Very simple, very straightforward question. Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. In the first statement, they tell us that 3 is less than x plus y over 2 which is less, which in turn is less than 4. Am I correct? Did I, did I copy it properly? Yes. X, in other words, the average of these two numbers, what they're telling us is that the average of these two numbers between 3 and 4. The question is how much is x plus y? Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. Well, here we see a 2 at the bottom. Let's get rid of, let's get rid of the 2 from the bottom here by multiplying the entire inequality by 2. Let's multiply the entire inequality by 2, which we can do which we can quite easily do because 2 obviously is a positive number. So we can multiply the entire inequality by any positive number without having to worry about switching the direction of the inequality. That's it. So here we see a 2. Let me rewrite this 2. I don't like the way it's written. Here we see a 2. And we see a 2 here. That 2 is going to cancel out. And that was the whole point. So that tells us that the x plus y lies between 6 and 8. What else do we know? We also know that they are integers. We are told that they are whole numbers. Well, if they are whole numbers, and if it lies between 6 and 8, there lies only one integer between 6 and 8. Only one integer lies between 6 and 8. We have no way of knowing. There is no way here if we can figure out individually what x and y are, and there is no need for us. We don't have to worry about what x is. We don't have to worry about what y is. The question here is, do we have sufficient data to tell them how much is x plus y to which the answer is x plus y would have to be 7. It would have to be 7. That's all. You're done. The first statement by itself is enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself is sufficient, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Let's look at second statement. The second statement tells us, second statement tells us that, again I want to make sure that, that uh, 2 is less than x, which is less than y, which is less than 5. Again, same exact, same exact argument as before. Same exact argument as before. Since we are told that they are both integers, and we are told that uh, this is the situation we are dealing with, that x is less than 2, and y is less than x, and y is less than 5, how many integers can possibly fall between 2 and 5? How many possible integers can fall between 2 and 5? Only 3 and 4. And since x is less than y, x would have to be 3 and y would have to be 4. That's the only possibility that will work here. That's the only scenario that will work here because of the fact that they have to be whole numbers. So x would have to be 3, y would have to be 4 because 2 is less than 3 and 3 is less than 4 and 4 is less than 5. So now, actually, second statement actually is stronger than the first statement because in the first statement we were unable to tell what x was and what y was individually, but we were able to tell that their sum has to be 7. This statement is actually even stronger because not only we are able to tell what the sum is, sum is clearly 7 here, same as before, they never contradict as you, as you know now, but we are actually able to tell the individual values, which, is, which, which, which wasn't necessary here. So we actually have more information that we need here. The second statement by itself is also more than sufficient. The answer is D. But if I'm going to phrase in, in that manner that second statement is more than sufficient, then I should not have used the word also, because that wasn't the case with the first one. The first statement was sufficient, 
second statement turns out is actually more than sufficient because not only we are able to tell their sum but we are actually able to tell the individual values. Let's move on to the next one, number 86. I need a break as always. Number 86. Let's see what we have in store for number in number 86. Number 86, they're asking us how much is B plus C. Again, when again when they're asking questions like this, how much is the sum of these number these two numbers, or what's the sum of these three numbers, or what's the sum of these five numbers? We don't, have, they, we don't have to worry about what their individual values are. We do not care what B is, we do not care what C is, as long as we can figure out their sum. That's what it is. Let's see what they tell us, shall we? Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement they tell us, oh this is a very algebraic question actually. In the first statement they tell us that A times B plus C times D plus A times C plus B times D equals 6. Let's see what we can do with it, shall we? Let's see what we can do with it. All, all that is required in this problem is simple algebraic manipulation. Now remember, C, B plus C is what we are interested in. Somehow we have to extract B plus C from here. So do you see C anywhere here? I see C right here. Where else do you see? I see a C right here. But we need B plus C. We need some, so we will have a C here. Where can we find the B? Oh, there you go. We found it. Okay, watch what happens. Here's our C and here is our B, there is a common factor of D. Do you see it? The common factor of D right here. That's our common factor. If we were to work with these two terms, we can take out D as a common factor and we'll have our B plus C. Let's see what happens. So, so, so let's rewrite this whole thing. So A plus B plus A plus C plus C plus D plus B plus D equals 6. Watch what happens, okay? Watch what happens. So all we have done actually is to rewrite these four terms in, in a slightly different order. That's all it is. I see an A here, I see A here, I see an A here. Let's take out this A as a common factor. If we take out A as a common factor, from the first term we are left with B, from the second term we are left with C. So far so good. Let's move on here. Here we have a common factor of D. Here we have a D and here we have a D. Let's take out D as a common factor. When we take out D as a common factor, we are left with C from here and we are left with B from here. Now we're gonna look at these two terms. And we realize that when we look at this term and this term, A times B plus C and D times C plus B, which is same as B plus C, let me write this as B plus C. We, we realize that the common factor here is this term right here, B plus C. Let's take it out as a common factor. B plus C is a common factor. Once we take that out, from here we are left with A. And from here we are left with D. And that equals 6. Question is, is this enough for us to be able to tell What's the value of B plus C? The answer is no, this is not enough. We cannot tell what B plus C is unless we know what A plus D is. The first statement by itself is not enough. First statement by itself is not enough. We need to know what the value of A plus D is. A, D, A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. The second statement tells us that A plus D, what do you know? They tell us that A plus D is 4. Again, always remember, we are looking at second statement by itself. Simply knowing that A plus D is 4 does not enable us to answer what B plus C is. Second statement by itself is not enough. It is now obviously not a worthless information, it's actually quite useful information, but by itself it's not sufficient. Answer cannot be B. And as soon as we put the two statements together, as soon as we put the two statements the two together, we get done, A plus D is 4. We substitute 4 here. When we put them together, I, I'm not going to actually do it, you, you understand what's going on here. A plus D now, when we put them together, A plus D is 4, this is the together part. When we put the two statements together, right here, B plus C must be 6 over 4. B plus C is 6 divided by 4, or 3 halves. The answer is C. Understand? But point here is not how much is B plus C. Nobody is asking us how much is B plus C. The point is, do we have enough, enough data to be able to ascertain the value of B plus C? The answer is yes. Okay, that's one. The answer is C. Let's move on to the next one. Number 87. Number 87.
What is the average of? What's the average of J and K? Very simple, very straightforward question. What is their average? Which, of course, we are able to see immediately that this is same as asking how much is how much is J plus K. That's all they are asking. How much is J plus K? Because of course, if we know their sum, we can figure out the average. Let's see what they tell us in the first statement, shall we? In the first statement, they, they tell us that the average, the average of j plus 2 and k plus 4 and k plus 4 is 11. Well, how do we find the average of two quantities? How do we find the average of two quantities? We take our first quantity, which is j plus 2, and we do it to it, we add the second quantity, which is k plus 4, and we divide that by 2. And that we are told is, is 11. Which is same as which is same as saying if we, if we were to multiply both sides by 2, we find that this quantity is 22. That's it, we are almost that's it. We are not going to continue. There's no point in continuing. We can figure out what j plus k is. J plus k, j plus k is simply this quantity 22 minus 6. That's it. And once we know the value of j plus k, we can figure out the average, obviously. The first statement by itself is quite sufficient. The first statement by itself does the job quite beautifully. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established the first statement by itself is sufficient, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at the second statement. Second statement tells us, second statement tells us that the average of J, K, and 14 is 10. I hope you are able to see also that this statement will also do the job quite nicely. The average of these three numbers is 10. Again, same exact thing. If the average of these three numbers is 10, that means J plus K plus 14 over 3, because we are taking the average of three quantities, is 10. Which is same as saying that their sum must be 30. Their sum must be 30. If their sum is 30, then j plus k, j plus k is simply 30 minus 14. Whatever the hell that is. Do you understand? That's all. Question is, what is their sum? The answer is 14. Second statement by itself also does the job quite beautifully. The answer turns out to be D. Let's move on then. Number 88. Number 88. Again, I need my break. Number 88. In number 88, we are told that a total of 100 tickets were sold by P and S. Question is, how many did P sell? How many tickets did P sell? Tickets were sold by P and S. How many tickets were sold by P? Given the fact that together they sold a total of 100. These two people together. Only these two people together. Do you understand? Sold a total of 100. Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that S sold two-third as many as P. Well, that's, that's quite enough. We know, we know, first of all, that S plus P has to be 100. We are, we are told that right here. We are told that they, together they sold 100 tickets. Now they're telling us that S sold two-third as many as P. S sold two-third as many as P. So S, S sold two-third as many as P. There is our equation. This is our S. S sold two-thirds as many as P, and of course we can solve for P. It's a simple linear equation. It's a simple linear equation. Once we can solve for P, we can, well, that's exactly what they're asking. That's it. We are done. The first statement by itself, A, D, B, C, E. The first statement by itself does the job quite nicely. We don't have to waste our time doing it out. The answer, now that we established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. What we are about to do is something we are doing for learning purposes, just for, for just for practice. It is not something we will waste our time in the real exam, as I always remind you. Let's do it out. I'm curious. 
So 2 thirds P plus a P, that is 3 thirds P. 3 thirds P plus 2 thirds P is 5 thirds P. 5 thirds P equals 100, which means that uh, 5 P equals 100 times 3, and therefore P equals 100 times 3 over 5, and that's 20. So that's 20 times 3 is 60. How many tickets does P sell? The answer is 60. But that was a sheer waste of time, you understand? Let's move on to second statement, shall we? We are done with this part. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that S sold 8% of, of all tickets. Now, how do we know? Listen to me. How do we know? Listen very carefully, okay? Listen very carefully. These are, these are some basic things that I keep repeating like a parrot in almost every video when we're doing data sufficiency. My question is, how do we know that even though it actually tells us in the board letter with a box around it, uh, my courtesy that is, but even, even if we were to read the way it was written here, let's see how the book actually tells me. Sandy sold 8% of all the tickets. My question is, how do we know that that's what they're talking about? 8% of all the tickets because Sandy could not have possibly sold 8% of the tickets sold by these two people together. Why? Because we just finished doing the work here and we established here that PE was 60. Since together they sold 100 tickets and PE from the first statement tells us, first statement tells us that PE was 60, which means Sandy must have sold 40% of all the tickets sold by these two individuals. Sandy must have sold, Sandy did sell 40% because P is 60. Sandy sells 40% of all the tickets that were sold by these two people. This, here, sec, the second statement does not talk about these two people, it talks about all the people. What I'm trying to point out is that, as you know by now, the two statements, the information in the two statements that is given, it, they never contradict each other. Never, ever, ever. If you do the work on the based on the information that is given to you in the first statement and you found out that the Michael is 20 years old and then you do the work based on the information that is given in the second statement and you arrive at the conclusion that the Michael is 15 years old, something has gone berserk. Something has gone awry. Either your work in the first statement was not, uh, not correct, that's one possibility, or the work in the second statement that you did is not correct, that's second possibility. Or there exists a third possibility, which is the work that you did in both the four statements, one and two, they were both wrong. Do you understand? But they cannot give you contradictory information. So if P is 60 from the first statement, P has to remain 60 from the second statement, which is why we know that it's 8% of all the tickets. But the point here, I'm, I'm making too much fuss about nothing. The point here is that simply knowing, oh, I should have raised that part, a, D, B, C, E. The first statement was enough, was it? I forget now. The first statement was enough. The answer cannot be B, C, or E. The point here is that simply knowing that Sandy sold 8% of all the tickets does not enable us to tell how many tickets P sold, or for that matter, how many tickets Sandy sold, because we don't know how many tickets, how many was the total number of tickets that were sold by all the people who were selling the tickets. The second statement does not do the job. The answer is A. The answer is A. Let's move on then to the very last problem on the page, number 89. Number 89. As usual, I need my break. It says a number of people, a number of people wrote down, wrote down one of the first 30 positive integers. A number of people wrote down one of the first 30 positive integers. One through 30 obviously. The question was, the question is, was there was there any repetition? Was there any repetition? I don't know how to spell repetition. Repi I believe 
the sun is spell repetition was there any repetition so we have a room full of people in the room there are a whole bunch of people sitting there and you ask everybody to write down a number on a, on, on a, on a piece of paper 1 through 30 any number of your choice 1 through 30 that's all question is was there any number between 1 and 30 that was repeated that's all there is let's see what they tell us in the first statement again as always Questions, of course, are always straightforward. It is the answer that gets prickly, as I always remind you. The first statement tells us that more than 40, more than 40 people wrote down an integer. Well, well, if more than 40 people wrote down an integer, and since there are only 30 integers to be used, some of the integer must have been repeated. Of course. At least what this tells us, what this tells us that at least, at least one integer, at least one integer, at least one integer must have been repeated. At least one integer must have been repeated. That has to be the case. Because even if the first 29 people, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth, up to 29, even if the first 29 people wrote down a distinct number, a unique number, 1 through 29, that's up to 29, which means the number 30, the number 30, number 30 must have been written down by 11 different people, because we have 29 people here, and 11 people wrote down either 30 or one of the, one of the numbers from 1 through 30, at least one number has to be repeated, do you understand? That's, that's, that's the, that's the lowest possibility. At least one integer was repeated. It has to be repeated because there are 40 people and only 30 numbers. Maybe more than one was repeated. More than one were repeated. Maybe there are 10 of them were repeated. Who knows? Or maybe maybe all 40 of them are repeated. Maybe all of the 40 people sat down there and put down 7, every one of them. In which case only one integer was used and it was used 40 times. But the point here is that given the fact that there are 40 people and 30 integers, at least one number must have been repeated. The question was was there any integers that was repeated? The answer is yes. We are able to say definitively yes to the question. The first statement by itself is enough. The first statement by itself is enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. 40 people wrote down. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that fewer, fewer than 70 people wrote down an integer. Fewer than 70 people wrote down an integer. This is not enough. This is not enough. Fewer, simply knowing that it's fewer than 70 does not do anything. For example, for example, if n happens to be less than or equal to 30, if n happens to be, if number of people in the room happens to be less than or equal to 30, then a number, uh, an integer, may or may not have been repeated. For example, if we have exactly 30 people in the room and you told everyone to write down a unique number from one, uh, you told everyone to write down one number, not unique number that is, obviously they have no way of knowing what everybody else is writing, I was, I was being stupid. If you, if you told people to write down uh, an integer, if you told, told everybody to write down an integer on a piece of paper, it is possible, highly unlikely, but it is possible that every one of them wrote down a unique integer, 1 through 30, because there are 30 people and 30 integers. So this tells us that if n happens to be less than or equal to 30, then an integer may or may not have been repeated. It may have been repeated also. It is also possible that there are 30 people in the room and you told them to write down one integer, 1 through 30, and every one of them sat there and put down number 9. It is possible. It is not, it is not beyond the realm of possibility. Highly unlikely, but not impossible. On the other hand, if n happens to be more than 30, if n happens to be more than 30, then just as before, just as before, if there are more than 30 people, then one number, at least one number, at least one number, one integer, has to be repeated. But because we do not know how many people there are in the room, because second statement only tells us, second statement tells us that there are fewer than 70 people. Well, fewer than 70, how many? 
we do not know. Is it less than 30 or is it more than 30? It doesn't tell us that. It just says fewer than 30. It's not enough. Second statement by itself is not enough. The answer is A. The second statement does not do the job. The first statement did the job quite nicely. But second statement, alas, did not. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.